but we got you now. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so for our community here, I, I've seen Geraldine on a documentary called Extraordinary, and uh, I heard you speak, and I was like, I got to get her on the show. And then I was pleasantly surprised to come across your YouTube channel where you discuss a lot of things esoteric. And that brought me great excitement because this week's subject with the community is sort of the abduction experience, a little bit of UFOs. But this channel has a long run of esoteric teachings, Gnostic things and stuff like that, in which you mm -hmm. seem to dabble in as well. So I guess my first question for you would be, what was the connection for you that went from your experience to the things that you are now, uh, that you're now teaching? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, it was amazing because first of all, how I even, so before, even though I'm a lifelong contactee, I've had experience since I was a little girl. Um, in reality, you know, there, I didn't have the language or I didn't have the experience to be able to say that those experiences were in fact ETs or interdimensionals in the way that I understand it now. Right. For me, those experiences were like a bright light in the room and these experiences, um, you know, my, I would equate them to something close to an angelic being or a be being of light, but that's as far as I would go. Right. Um, it wasn't until, um, the year of 2013 that I really dove into meditation and I began to deprogram um, my root core belief system in okay. order to understand what was truth, what was love. Those were the main questions that I had. And essentially through that pursuit is actually where I discovered um, this understanding, the profound understanding of what lies beyond these interdiment, this, uh, this reality, this so-called reality that we call everyday life, um, and the construct that we see as a holographic system, a matrix, right. um, you know, what lies beyond that? And that's where I had this conscious experience, uh, right. which activated my psychic abilities. So for me, that was the first. And I guess, uh, you know, five years down the road, uh, from 2013 to 2017, that's when I completely transformed my life because I understood that there were, it's impossible to live this kind of dualistic life where you compartmentalize these experiences away from everyday life. Mm -hmm. And I, I realized that actually it's within the integration that actually lies the most powerful use of these kinds of experiences because that's where you begin to understand something greater. Um, my, my first inquiry into these downloads of information were, well, what is the hybridization program? Mm -hmm. And essentially, what role does the soul play in mm -hmm. these interdimensional experiences? And that's where, essentially, when you go as far down into the rabbit hole of ET contact, you're going to be met with the question of consciousness. Where is consciousness? What is consciousness? Right. And if you go down the rabbit hole of spirituality you begin to enter the exact same question as you as you interact with interdimensional realms, interdimensional beings, higher consciousness. Um, and so they there there's a point there where these two meet. And right. that's really where my work kind of manifested also into the biology of humanity. Right. Yeah. I, I, I find it interesting that these experiences and these beings are not as simple as most people assume. Everyone in the mainstream narrative is so quick to call them, you know, like people from another planet. But we have to realize that that's, that's a reflection of us. And, it, and it's more abstract. And I've noticed a lot of contactees who they have to awaken to their experiences because these experiences are so abstract that you can't pin it down to something. So the subconscious mind kind of swallows the experience and the conscious mind tends to forget about it. It's all, it's not like they're giving you a men in black little eraser brain thing as much as the conscious mind, like Whitley Stryber had said, the conscious mind doesn't know what to do with this information or these beings. It's as if two entirely different realities are merging, so to speak, you know? And for whatever reason, we seem to be the keyhole for them to exist physically, if that makes any sense. 
Yeah, that's an amazing observation. I mean, if we take a look at historically, there has been history of every human in history and in every era of uh, contact, some kind of contact with higher consciousness, whether it's the gods that come down to merge with the humans, as we see in the Book of Enoch, Emerald Tablets, so on and so forth. Um, Or you begin to look at the history of Anunnaki's around the earth. But humans have uh, interacted with higher dimensional or interdimensional beings for as long as we can remember. So, um, you know, and, and now that we are more perhaps have the information and the knowledge available to us about how our biology works, our hologram, holographic system works, the physics, um, you know, and also the biological aspect of that is, is functioning. Uh, we kind of have, a, a, a slightly better grasp on how manifestation comes into play. Um, we look at how the morphogenetic field, for example, functions. The morphogenetic field is basically the instruction manual of that brings things into form. So um, if you just look at that and think about that for a minute, um, we play a major part in the kinds of things that we are experiencing. And further, further to that, Um, In my research with my contactees, what I have discovered over the uh, past few years is that ET contact runs ancestrally in bloodlines, in family bloodlines. Right. Um, You know, so we're interviewing, uh, you know, many of family members separately. They're under hypnosis or separately just interviewed about their experiences. And they start to talk about similar beings that they're interacting with. Right. And, um, you know, we're noticing it goes down to generations. So, you know, really, um, we kind of what the way I look at it is that, you know, the element of interdimensionality is very much a human element. We just are kind of covered with veils. We have yeah. veils of, of perceptions that are really manufactured a lot right. by social engineering, um, you know, film industry, music right. that kind of make us think that aliens or the concept of ETs are something completely unreal. Right. But, um, you know, that's very far from reality because millions of humans are having experiences every day. Right. So, yeah. So well, we're, we're kind of... Mm-hmm. Whenever I read an experience, uh, I, I watched your uh, episode on YouTube where you broke it down. And I mean, everything from that to uh, like the woman in the 1600s who was abducted by fairies and uh, and she was made to mother these hybrid children who weren't getting enough love. And that was actually a common occurrence uh, back in the 1600s, you know, it, it, and when you pay attention to them and you get the sci fi movies out of the way, you start to realize that. Our consciousness does do a dance with these, uh, with this other reality, and it's more akin to me, at least. And this might be naive to say because I am not in any way, shape, or form a contact E. But it seems closer to a DMT or ayahuasca experience than it does any sort of sci-fi film that has been popularized. And it goes to show you that a lot like a, a Rorschach test or or an ink block test would be given to somebody. Um, we seem to paint something abstract with our own expectations, and that becomes the memory. And, and the screen memory is sort of a uh, common theme in these abductions. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing there, because just like an ink block test, there is a piece of paper with ink on it to be looked at. So it's something so uh, outside of our understanding that we almost, in order to grasp it, we have to give it a name and a category, you know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. And another thing that's really interesting is that after interviewing thousands of contactees, the way that the interdimensional beings are being described, there's a certain kind of collective consciousness and collective awareness of the kind of beings that we're interacting with. Right. Now, whether... I, whether yeah, it's very right. interesting because whether we begin to research maybe the collective subconscious belief systems um, or you begin to look at historically what's kind of been programmed organically within us is the history of these beings, whether they look like birds, like bird-like heads, whether they look like angelic beings with wings, whether they look like um, uh, greys, you know, or they look like mantids, uh, draconians, reptilians. 
See, these are very important archetypal uh, manifestations that we see throughout the world in every ancient culture, every ancient civilization, from the Hopi Indians to the Hindis to the um, e even the ancient Chinese cultures in South America. You begin to see all of these little parallels of these subconscious core collective ideas. Right. So and even biblical times. Uh oh. Okay. I think it's starting to glitch just a quite just a little bit. Okay. Okay. But we're back now. Can you rewind five seconds? <clears throat> Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so if we just go around the world looking at all of the ancient civilizations, um, the way that they depict, for example, the snake people or the reptilian people or the dragons, right? Right. So different cultural groups have talked about these beings that manifest from the ethers into these manifestations, archetypal manifestations. Okay, so we're still tuning in to those things. In right. our modern day culture, even if we're not reading those books or familiar with the culture, people right. are organically having those kinds of experiences with these beings. Right. So it means that there's some kind of architecture to this realm in the non-physical realm. Right. There, there, there's a pattern to it. It's, it's got a crystalline structure to it. And, uh, and I'm a big fan of Jung, and you've used a couple keywords there that have shown me that you are as well. And it, and Jung seems to have it kind of nailed down in a way that uh, that that we are still start try, trying to catch up with. But uh, Jung broke down a lot of abduction experiences, uh, not quite as a skeptic, but also not as a believer in the ET hypothesis. So he was ahead of his time, but he was baffled by the amount of symbolic imagery or archetypes in people's. Uh, abduction experiences who were not keen to mythology or the occult whatsoever. So right. they were, they found these uh, symbols within their experiences, but didn't know what to make of them. So, and you know, obviously they, they needed guidance. They needed help after these things to integrate what they experienced. And it becomes something truly esoteric. It's almost as if this thing is trying to leap into our reality to teach us things through through you guys, you know? Yes. But actually, the way that I now see it is that it's actually coming from the inside out. I believe that all this yeah. information, yeah, I believe that this information is, is encoded in our DNA. Okay. And I feel that we, we are actually, as we activate DNA, as we unlock the suppressed memory, and I'm talking about the collective memory of what you are, right. you begin to uncover the layers of your true self, which is, not completely stuck in one form, the human form. We are many things, and we actually exist in many dimensional layers. Uh -huh. um, and so what we're seeing, you know, psychologically, the human is in during dream state, because most of these experiences are during dream state. You know, so that See. tells us something, because we are leaving the body. Our work and our experiences in dream state are extremely important, maybe even more important than your waking state. Because um, we program so much and we do so much in those dream states. And the more you become lucid in the waking state, you actually want to try to bring that into that dream state so that you can recall more. And that's what happens with most contactees when they start meditating, when they start doing some of these practices of awareness, um, they begin to recover memories that were suppressed from childhood. And um you know, it's part of the human education. We are learning what we are beyond this physical realm. And, and I very much feel that it is um, encoded in our DNA. It's part of the human experience to recognize at some point that you are multidimensional. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, with the DNA, which is something that we cover on this channel quite a bit as being a language, and I've argued so many times, and to beat a dead horse to my viewers, that there's probably no such thing as junk DNA. That seems to me to be nonsense. I can't find anything in nature that is just completely unnecessary. You know, even the appendix we just found out recently does something. It, it breaks down red meat. Uh, so we still use that, and we didn't know that we were. So science seems to be, you know, catching up with the Zen masters every so often, and the DNA, whether it's meditation, breathing exercises, DMT experience, 
it seems to, I like the way you put that, that it might be coming from the inside out because the more I look at the reality, it seems that we're projecting reality. Like the yes. Brahma is, yes. is dreaming us. So we seem to be dreaming our surroundings and make no mistake, you know, uh, the things that we think about in our everyday lives is our literal reality tomorrow. So yes. this wouldn't be any different with the abduction experience if you think about it. So let me ask you this. Do you think that is purely something from the inside out or do you think that it has to have a, a north and south polarity, so to speak, to be able to do you think that there is something else objective outside of us that interacts with it or is it just from us? Yeah, that's an incredible question. Well, the way that I look at it and the way that I'm seeing, and this is from actually traveling these realms, but also after collecting information from many people that have channeled information about these realms, what we're kind of piecing together, you know, the soul, uh, incarnates into this physical dimension okay right. and the physical dimension has a very specific construct um which is a dualistic nature and we can go deep into the physics of that but essentially that dualistic nature allows us to experience these contrasts um i feel that that as a base fundamental okay. architecture is the first step to understand Within that construct, we come into something called the morphogenetic field. The morphogenetic field is where this construct gets its information on how to manifest its physical form. Okay. Um, and so from there, from that construct, based on the elements, based on our environment, based on all the laws of physics of this realm, the human comes into manifestation. Okay. But the human, it's just one vessel, which, um, which is one fractal of many, many fractals of this organism. So you yourself are a multidimensional organism. You exist in many dimensions simultaneous to this one. Um, and this is one way that we can kind of begin to put our ideas around what dream realms would kind of manifest to be, that when you leave your body, depending on your vibrational frequency, depending on the spin rate of your vortex, because our body is very much functioning like a vortex, right. um, you know, that oscillation makes you a match to different dimensional layers. And there's a very biological, biochemical, bioelectrical side effects to that. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about that a little deeper. We can induce these experiences. And, right. and that's something that our government has exper experimented on. Um, yeah. There's lots of papers on that and research on that, that we can induce leaving the body into these states. We can induce creating DMT, as you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. which allows you to have this vision. You're activating the higher faculties to be able to engage with these interdimensional beings that already exist within this internal realms. Right. But it's through the body that we get to access this. So if you think of it that way, the morphogenetic field being a source code that is embedded into your DNA, which then is projected into these experiences. Right. So I very much feel that, you know, it's something that emerges from within. We are in many layers of uh, a database of, of potential, infinite potential, right. um, kind of guided by the laws of this realm, one realm. Right. Uh, but but the the magic of the human, the incredible thing of the human is that the human has the ability to navigate more than one dimension. Right. Um, we know that when we interact with ghosts in this moment, you know, like these beings, or we sense someone's presence next to us, right. we are moving through dimensions because they're not physical, but you sure can feel through your physical body and tune into these beings. So just like a radio dial, you kind of right. move in and out. Um, so, yeah, uh, to, to answer the question, I think it is something that's coming from internal. Right. And that's, I think, the perfect answer because, uh, and I, it seems as if you don't mind getting overtly scientific here, and that's awesome, because this morphog morphogenetic field reminds me of Rupert Sheldrake and the, uh, these, these studies that he conducted that if mice, or not even mice, but any living organism, people, if they solve a puzzle in Europe, and then we have the same puzzle for the same amount of people in America, they will do better now that these people have done it, and it goes both ways. Exactly. Uh, it's like they're bouncing off of each other. And another bit of science that you, you seem to be describing is... Uh, uh, Robert Temple has a book out called A New Science of Heaven, 
And he hypothesizes that plasma itself, that is the ether, the uh, what we thought was vacuum, emptiness of space, is actually yes. very much alive and exactly. conscious and, and aware of itself. And it makes me wonder if if that aliveness, because if, say, an Oort cloud is conscious and aware of itself, the, the storage capacity and memory of that must be something that just makes us dwarfed in comparison. Our greatest computers would be nothing compared to that to that exactly. amount of computing power. I wonder if it's trying to sort of wake us up. And if anything, I wonder if, because uh, uh, Temple describes this physical reality as being only like 0.001% of actual reality. And that plasmatic uh, matter is actually dominant in the universe. So we, this, you know, hard matter is the anomaly. Just like us, when we go to study something that we don't understand, this consciousness, these entities might be studying us, might be uh, in, enthusiastically obsessed with the, how we re, how we reproduce, because plasma can't necessarily reproduce. You know, much like uh, I've said, like a virus does not reproduce. Two viruses can't come together to reproduce. They need a host, and that makes me loosely hypothesize about why this hybridization program might be happening. You know, there's a merging taking place and as scary as it is, if that's, if that is the case, then this would be something that is more involved on the spectrum of love than it is what people assume, you know? Yeah. I love that you mentioned that. I mean, what we're learning now, you know, with the hybridization program is that there seems to be some kind of self-organized um, intelligence to this system, you know, and it's it's an intelligence of co-creation because you're here to experience creation, this dualistic nature, the law of three, which is the base fu uh, fundamental law of this realm, and the integration of the feminine and masculine creates the third, right. and the third would be all creation, and you are a being of absolute creation. You create with your words, your you know your thoughts, your sounds. Your you know you bring a child into this realm, but in that same way, that that creation, the way that we create, we're just very we're learning what it means to create because we're actually creating in many dimensions simultaneously. Right. But but what is important about this is evolution is kind of a natural part of this system. So we are evolving, whether you like it or not, you are evolving. Um, now the question is how aware are you of that evolution of that evolution? We seem um, to be resisting it. That's true. Sometimes we're resisting. And what happens when you resist, or the opposite of that evolution would be to repeat cycles, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's another right. architecture of this system that this law of three creates cyclical cycles, cycles in these toroidal fields, which all of nature is, is taking on this pattern. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, and this is where the hybridization program plays a role because we're essentially making agreements to bring a soul. That's a major agreement is to anchor a soul into this realm. There's major entanglement. There's, uh, you know, major, I mean, every cell in your body is present in the cell of this other organism to quantum non-locality. Every choice that you make is kind of enlaced with every organism that you anchor here. So we're now waking up consciousness to the power of our co-creation that right. is actually existing on more than one dimension. So right. what is your role? Your role is to become aware, to become awake, to become conscious of your creation so that you can begin to experience some level of free will because otherwise we're just repeating unconscious cycles. And in the same way that we have, have that's been brought to our attention through the hybridization program, mm -hmm. we create hybrids on this earth, right? So our children are hybrids as well. Because we are hybridizing ancestral lineages that have been repeating right. with very specific information for centuries. And one of the, the beauty of this realm is that because of this evolutionary model, we have the opportunity to refine the frequency of your ancestral lineage to a point of an organism that is fully in a state of love. 
which is not an emotion. It's the ultimate creative creativity. Right. It's yeah. the ultimate ability to create infinite potential. It, it was hypothesized in Edadorpa that lo love seems to be gravitation. And I don't, I'm not using a metaphor. It yes. seems as though gravity and love might be one in the same phenomenon, neither of which we seem to understand here mm -hmm. in this particular thin veil of reality, unfortunately. And, and I mean, it, it, it seems the unwillingness is coming from a place of ignorance, especially when you, we see these misunderstandings of the symbolic nature of contact. Uh, I, so like, uh, uh, communion, uh, Whitley, Whitley Strieber, for example, uh, he resisted. And the book is a journey. I mean, by the end of it, he has accepted himself as a participant in this program. And But in the beginning of the book, he was screaming. And then the beings asked him with a little machine, they said, what can we do to get you to stop screaming? And he joked <laughs> later on saying, well, one of the things would be to turn off that machine. You know, and he, he found, you know, some funnies in there, fortunately, but he resisted at first uh, because it was something that he did not understand. But eventually, once he understood the symbolic, the esoteric nature of this and he got the sci-fi realm out of his head, he realized that he was partaking in something bigger. He went from being a lab rat to being a co-creator. And that what, that's what I think is the most important part here, you know. Exactly. And it also, this transformation that you just explained right now is kind of what I do in my work and what a lot of people are doing as experiencers, speaking to other experiencers. Mm -hmm. How do you transform this experience that seemingly, because, you know, all humans, we're afraid of the unknown. We're right. quite, we are quite trained, in fact, to be very afraid of the unknown. Afraid um, of change. Yeah. Exactly. Change, you know. Uh, so, so we have to learn in our, so in our, in our lives, spiritually, emotionally, energetically, to be okay with the unknown. And so interdimensionally, that's another element. Um, the human has the ability to transmute negative experiences into positive. And, and usually right. that's just, it's just a, a matter of broadening your perception to be able to see the bigger picture, as opposed to looking at it from a very myopic you know, view. And, Absolutely. And, and, mm -hmm. um, and, and that brings me to uh, sort of what can be used as an argument, and I'm sure has been used. And just to clear it up, it's like some people are skeptical of people like yourself or Whitley Strieber because there is a um, there's a service being provided and it involves being a contact E. And what I want people to understand is that that's no different from what I am doing. Um, now this, this channel that we're watching right now happens to have been ignited from a so-called dark night of the soul, right? Mm -hmm. So I went through uh, a nine month period of absolute hell that sort of, it just destroyed, eviscerated my worldview. All of my beliefs of th the, the ground I walked on psychologically was gone. So then now once that sort of passes and it never really does pass, you can see clearly in such a way that now you can offer a service to people based on where you've been. And in a way, it's actually contradictory to be seeking help from people, psychologists who have never had pain, uh, an abduction therapist who, who's never been abducted. That's actually what would be asked backwards compared to what you are doing and, and what we are doing here. You want to be speaking with the person who has been there, done that, so to speak. And to me, it makes more sense in that fashion. It's like, yes, I know that Whitley Strieber made a lot of money off of communion, but that's exactly what the skeptic would have done also, you know? <laughs> yes. Yes. And also we, we want to normalize the experience, uh, right. these experiences, because, you know, uh, where I'm not a special person, experiencers are not really special people. We simply maybe ask certain questions um, and we, you know, share them openly. But the invitation is for you. Don't take my word for it. Nothing. Don't believe anything I say. You need to experience for yourself whether that is true. And the interesting thing about contact experience is that you can call it forth. You can manifest it in your life if that's what you want to experience. 
there is a certain point of initiation that occurs um, mm. with a human. And I, I believe that that is happening now uh, more than ever. More people are having experiences. And at least with these conversations that you're providing on your platform and also the films that we've been doing, we're starting to put together a new language that never existed before. It's the, it's the language of the contactee. Right. You know, uh, when you come to the support group, you know, what does it mean to have a recall memory? What does it mean to uh, you know, have missing time? All of these elements that people compartmentalize because they have no idea, you begin to put together and now the picture is becoming clear. Right. And um, you begin to realize, yeah, I'm not going crazy. You know, there's nothing weird going on. And I just want to be very clear. All of my experiences in my life have, uh, I have never done drugs or any psychedelics of any kind. All of these experiences are completely. That makes one of us. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people do it through psychedelics. But, right. you know, I'm actually extremely sensitive and allergic to all kinds of medications. I cannot take anything. So. All of these experiences have been very organic and my intuitive abilities also. So it means you can too, you know, right. you can develop, you can cultivate that. And all the ancient cultures, um, schools of thoughts, of wisdom of, of, the, of the human self have all advocated that when you cultivate your energy and intuitive body, then you start having these interdimensional awareness. So it's See, part of the human, I think it's part of the natural human experience, honestly. I, that's probably the direction that we're supposed to go as a species, instead of just yes. running in circles, which tends to, I think, cause consumerism. If you live in a physical reality strictly, that's your go-to is consumerism, you know, uh, which has obviously gotten us in big trouble. Uh, so what techniques would you... And now I, I've been talking to my audience for a long time about breathing exercises. You know, that's kind of my little meditation. Do you have anything to add to that? What would you recommend? Yes. Well, um, I teach uh, uh, something called running energy, and it's a very powerful technique. It's an ancient technique. It's kind of like a speedway into clearing your body from the debris of the unconscious cyclical patterns that you're living. So. Um, what do we do? We kind of begin to train our intuition so that you can tune into your multidimensional body, become aware of what you're holding on to. What are the holding patterns emotionally that you have uh, that you're running through every day that limit you? Um, and you can simply access those two ways. You can train your intuition to begin to see them forming and blocking your energetic field, or you can go through your emotional body. So I work. So because of the the nature of the human body and the hu human biology. I work a lot with earth frequencies, with frequencies, you know, with energy, um, because we, we are energy, we are frequencies. So we have to learn how to move energy through the body in order to gain clarity, in order to have healing. And so we work with green life force, green earth life force. We okay. bring it into the body and we begin to clear and the vortex of the body with this green life force. And you can also bring cosmic gold energy and combine it and start running it through the body. And um, there, there's something I created called Qi Pack, which is a very simple but very powerful energy hygiene technique, which involves grounding, aligning, uh, protecting or becoming aware of your energetic space, aligning your chakras, which is, which is basically your perception. Your perception emerges from the way that your chakras are processing information. Okay. Um, and... Uh, your crown, activating your crown, which is one of the most important. This is your center of manifestation. See. So, yeah, so if you if you kind of start, and I teach these in depth in my channel. You guys can check that out if you want. And Geraldine Ross. Her website is in the description, guys. Yeah, you can uh, check it there. Mm -hmm. I find the color green to be fascinating um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's in the center of the color spectrum. On the color wheel, it's in the absolute middle. I mean, as far as our yes. perception goes, you know, yes. the emerald tablets were green and green seems to be, I mean, obviously, you know, plant life and everything like that. It seems to be the most healing color. If I'm not mistaken, it's the heart exactly. chakra, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then purple is the, it's either here or here. I forgot. That's right. That's which right. one it is. But, uh, I, I, the color green seems to be a reoccurring, uh, like a source of healing. If you go walking in the, in the grass with your bare feet, uh, people really underestimate how powerful that can be. 
Yes. You know, yeah. uh, and that's interesting that the colors would come up there because colors have a frequency very much like like sound frequencies do. And I'm a big fan of, you know, playing the uh, the binaural beats and the uh, the Monroe Institute has the uh, those frequencies you can listen to that sort of gets you out of your own body a little bit uh, for some easier than others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, it's that that's a that's a fascinating way to go about it. Uh, sometimes I feel like I, I stick to the breathing exercises uh, uh, so much, but man, I, it really does work for me though. That's amazing. Uh, com- right, combining yeah. things also are, is very helpful. Oh, absolutely. Or or actually, simply trying to let go of things to come as much to the zero point, mm-hmm. which means to come into absolute stillness absolute state training the observer actually can take you even further than any other technique training um, the observer can, can you elaborate on that a bit if- yeah so basically if you think of your five senses and if you take a moment to tune in to each one of your five senses alternating going back from slow to fast The one that is observing each one of those five senses, that is your true self. That is the one that you want to develop. That little observer inside of you that is observing and sensing from the sensation body, the physical vessel. Yeah. Okay. So that observer has to be developed. And that observer can be developed by practicing Vipassana meditation, for example, just training your body to be in absolute stillness of observation. Um, and help you regulate your nervous system. But yeah. also what happens with this kind of meditation is that you grow gray matter in your brain. You actually grow, and gray matter is extremely important because you are a bioelectrical organism. Um, right. You And eventually you begin to grow gray matter down your spine. Um, and this is where, you know, concepts of alchemy, you know, start to come in where you begin to learn how to transmute your life force Mm-hmm. Um, transmuting emotions from low emotions into high higher states of awareness. Yeah. Um, all of this is part of learning how to master your body. And this is how we begin to wake up consciousness from states of sorrow, depression, helplessness into states of harmony. Harmony, very important. Harmony doesn't have any one specific emotion. I didn't say joy. I didn't say happiness because that's not the goal. The right. goal is harmony, actually. Um, And that's kind of what we're trying to learn how to cultivate. We're trying to cultivate harmony within ourselves and harmony with the things outside of us. Right. Um, Oh, sorry. Well, (laughs) people seem to focus on this joy thing, this happiness thing. They're going to be top heavy. There's no, you can't have it pure joy all the time. In which case, there's no sacrifice taking place here this is like having fast food instead of getting ingredients to do the work to cook a meal you're going to suffer in the end and and harmony is a perfect way to put that because with harmony just like a home cooked meal you are going to benefit from that in the long run versus pleasure now joy now all these things now they they, they everybody in within i don't want to say this community cuz not the specific community but there's a misconception in um in the spiritual community about good vibes only well (laughs) that's not harmony that's not going to have a the the, uh the frequencies the multiple frequencies because to have a harmony you need multiple frequencies you know and uh, the good vibes only thing is going to be denying quite a bit of uh wholeness i think right right i think in this kind of work we want to it's really powerful to become so aware of your shadow self. So all the deep negative emotions that you have of yourself, actually that's where you want to start first. Right. So for example, if you're sitting in meditation and all of a sudden a really strong emotion, negative emotion starts coming up. When you sit with that emotion, emotions are multi-layered. Actually they begin to unfold for you. So if you name out the emotions that you begin to feel, you're going to begin to create kind of a formula of how you encoded emotional memory in your body and you can actually go into the root cause of that emotion you can go most people this is what i do in dna reprogramming with my clients is through the emotional body going back to the root moment when you took on that program that memory and it's really amazing that when people begin to access that root cause and deprogram the belief system that was created um they experience 
freedom, freedom, expansion, you know, um, yeah. a, a more expansive way of observing life and themselves. And it's extremely healing. Um, so these are little techniques that you can help yourself. Another thing that I was going to mention is that your chakra system is storing all of these emotional memories. You can actually learn how to control your chakras opening and So, uh, you know, I'm not going to lengthy discussion of that now. Probably we don't have so much time, but um, this is another important thing to learn. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's good to touch upon the, the chakras because, I mean, they they are there and they, they can be felt, you know. Uh, a lot of people argue that the, the chakras can't be opened up and pulled out of the body by a surgeon, but, you know, neither can ideas out of a brain. That doesn't make them <laughs> any less real, you know. And in a way, going to that root cause of pain is indeed, that, that takes getting your hands dirty. And in a way, that seems to be almost parallel to what the abduction experience uh, uh, teaches certain people, because that's fear. That's pure fear right there. And I mean, you know, when I, when I read uh, certain accounts, uh, I've, been ta I've been reading about the, uh, the Allagash abduction and... Uh, well, what's the one with the, the gray, uh, wrinkly dudes, the two men who were fishing? Uh, I, just, I got a book coming in the mail. Uh, I, I forgot which one it was, but it was sheer fear and a, a, a type of fear that is not relative to any kind of fear we know. Like, for example, the worst thing that can happen to a person in history, say like the, uh, the Genghis Khan. Thing. like you know uh, burning villages at least they knew what they were dealing with and in the case of uh some of these abductions it is it's a sheer abyss of complete unknowing and i mean that is that's real fear and in a way that that whitley streber kind of had to get to that root cause of that fear before he could you know integrate that into joy and eventually it actually became joy if, if you can imagine that something that is the your worst fear becoming the very same source that you derive joy from. I mean, a miraculous, I wouldn't say is a uh, too hardcore of a word for that. That's exactly what that is. And in a way, uh, that's alchemy right there. But the same exact thing goes for psychology. Uh, and you mentioned the shadow, uh, the, that Jungian element. People are really quick to deny that shadow because it's really uncomfortable. But I've noticed that... Uh, with a little bit of assistance, because you don't want to, you don't want to make yourself a madman. But if you allow yourself to have these intrusive thoughts, and you let them roll, just let them run, let them roll, they disappear. They get worn out. They exercise, and they and they they eventually go away. But they don't just go away. They become a fertilizer for, uh, for, for growth to take place. I think you know. Yeah. Well, you know, we have to remember that every single thought that we have, you know, when you reinforce it, it literally is a neural pathway that you create in your brain. Okay. Uh -huh. So, you know, we have millions of neural pathways to belief systems. The more that you strengthen those pathways by repeating those belief systems, uh -huh. you know, they're harder to break. Right. So in this kind of DNA reprogramming and in any kind of healing of severe trauma, whether it's ancestral trauma from World War II or whether it's something uh, that happened to you as a child, an abduction experience that happened to you, um, to begin to work with that, we need to understand it. And this is really the beauty of life and really why we come into this human arc to experience this dualistic experience in the first place. You are... You are breaking a neural pathway, but you have to learn how to create a new one. And that's this is the part that most humans have difficult time doing. Many of us, we are not familiar with peace. The truth is, we really don't know what peace is. We don't know what it feels like. Some of us have never felt it. Um, and wow. and we, need to, we need to recognize, you know, how much do we really know what happiness is? Or are we just mimicking what mom and dad showed us or maybe what we saw on TV? Right. Um, you know, because that, that's actually quite true for a lot of us, unfortunately, that real true states of joy and happiness we haven't really experienced. Um, and so we have to teach ourselves to identify that and to feel that because it's an entire restructuring of your biochemical system.
Yeah. And that, because we are addicted, we are biochemically addicted to a lot of our negative emotions. So we have to biohack the body yeah. in order to replace this addictive emotion with something different, like peace, for example, or happiness or joy, um, and make ourselves become familiar with those and implement them into our everyday lives, make a practice every day to actually make time to feel gratitude. And the amazing thing that I discovered is that when I implemented these high vibration training techniques for myself, which, which is the deprogramming of your old traumatic experiences, that, that was how I ended up having these experiences interdimensionally because it's very much a vibrational frequency game, to, to, so to speak. You know, when you shift your frequency, you are you become aware of other things that you may not have been aware of before. And that's part of this human experience that the more that you expand your frequency range, your visible, your, your yeah. attention, your awareness of these vis uh, physical uh, vibrational frequencies, you know, the more you learn, the more you yeah. get to know yourself in many dimensions. The, that, that expansion, I feel like, is directly akin to the comfort zone. I, the, the bubble that sure. we are in, you know, uh, okay. it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, anything, public speaking or clowns, you know, uh, we don't like those things. So by gentle exposure to those things here and there, you get a little poop, poop, and then you, you level up, you know, and now you're stronger, but that's the idea of a bubble. That's the sphere is you don't just level up here where you're afraid of clowns. You just leveled up over here too, because the whole bubble expands. Consciousness exactly. is uh, is a tor toroidal shape. If I'm exactly. not right, exactly. so you, you're not. Okay. Uh, but when you make yourself stronger over here, and that doesn't mean exposing yourself to fear either. That could yeah. be learning a new language. It could be exposing yourself to abstract ideas. You know, uh, it took me years to be able to just swallow any sort of yum. Like I would read. I read read book by Carl Jung and I just read it blind. I was not <laughs> in the conversation. I was just a toddler reading along. And, you know, so I, I read it. Then I went backwards to some of his older stuff and I, I, I trained myself. I, I, you know, I got to that point where I could lift that weight. And then the book scared the hell out of me, unfortunately, <laughs> but that's another way to grow that bubble outwardly. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. uh, consciousness is just like a muscle, you know, yes. we can, we can work it out. Exactly. Yeah. And the key is observation. The key is observation. Mm -hmm. When you observe, that's when you actually get to. And I just want to mention something because you did say something important about the chakras that when you expand, you can't remove them. Yeah. I did see for some reason a couple of years ago, someone talking about being able to remove the chakras from the body. Um, you just reminded me of that. But in reality, you know, uh, the way that I see it and the way that many people are kind of tuning into us is that we're. We're, a, we're actually, the physical body comes into form as a result of these vortices, which are the chakra bodies, which bring life force and irrigate life into this body. So, right. you know, this, the chakras are, they're filters of perception. And essentially, a chakra is expanded if that's the one that you're using, if that, that frequency that is run in that, in that uh, vortex mm -hmm. of your body is the one that you're most reinforcing so okay. remember that just the way we have neural pathways we also have energetic runways in our body that connect us to people places and things through vibrational frequency so we actually have neural pathways biologically through the organism through the physical body to people places and things which some people call cords but essentially we are deeply interconnected with these things and right. it's through our frequency our resonance that actually attracts people places and things as a match to us that allow us to experience the things we're having and the thing that that we need to remember is that that law is true also in dream state so if you are having a lot of fear in your lifetime if you're having uh if you're in a constant state of survival and protection Trust me, your dream state will be exact mirror of that. And yep. the interdimensional beings, experiences that you have, let's say you're super psychic, uh, empathic, they're going to be along the, those same lines. Yeah. Right. It, uh, 
it's that survive the survival mode versus thriving mode, or someone might call it creative mode, is the biggest shift that that I still struggle with to this day. And and a lot of people might be lying to say that they're not, but um, the survival mode that's that's real. And I I feel like we are not only programmed to stay in survival mode. But I feel like it's on purpose because, I mean, it's it's like it's almost as if like paying the bills and doing the things that we're told to do is has been normalized. Well, I shouldn't even have to say it's been normalized. I mean, that's what is quite literally called the, the American dream. Uh, but that bubble, that expansion of consciousness just stops there like a brick wall and it's really hard to see outside of that because it's been called the American dream. It's been called the, it's like the, literally the best thing that can possibly happen to you is to get a good job and pay your bills on time. People call that thriving. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong. If that's what makes a person happy, that's fantastic. And I yeah. am rooting for that person. That's, that's great. Uh, there was once upon a time I thought that that's exactly what I was supposed to do. And I yeah. felt, joy in that it turned out it turned out that the joy i got from that was more of a approval more of a fitting in type of deal and once that as i mentioned earlier completely shattered i walked out into the cold and into that that real suffering of uh of self-scrutiny and that's where things started to kind of uh the the lights started switching on so to speak you know amazing amazing it's, yes it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Amazing. But it That's helps. Just, oh, absolutely. No, and I also had the exact same experience. I mean, uh, you know, I did everything that this matrix says you're supposed to do to be successful. Right. And yet there was still so much suffering, emptiness, uh, well, and void inside of me. So I said, well, it. yeah, this isn't right. it. You know, there's something more. And so that's where you begin to question, well, you know, what, what is life? You know, what is love? And um, these are questions we all need to, it's their initiations into the awareness of yourself. And what you discover is that, you know, this matrix is so deeply constructed. But the thing is, we're not victims. The problem is that we are victims to our own ignorance. And that's why we need to become aware, you know, right. of what we are your power of creation in this realm and in order to co-create and break away from those illusions of slavery to the repetitive right. cycles of survival, you know, so that has to be broken. And the invitation of many of you beautiful souls that are here on this chat here today, you know, you've chosen to come at this incredible time to break many ancestral programs by recovering the memory of who you are, because you essentially, you're all and nothing simultaneously. When you start to shift your perception to see things like that, it completely changes where you put your attention, what you value. Um, and, I, oh, mm -hmm. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Well, it, well, what that reminded me of was, because where you put your attention in the survival mode thing, I, how many people have you noticed in your life who will say, oh, I'm so sick of drama? I, I don't like this drama shit. I, why does drama always? It's like, well, that's because you're paying attention to it and you are participating in it. It's right. literally that simple. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And so um, I think one thing, because I'm, I'm, I try to uh, understand the back end of things so I can understand how, how, how does my energy into, let's say, watching this film or where I put my money. Uh, my attention, my energy, my everyday life uh, is affecting the greater picture. Um, and because everything is energy, you begin to realize that, you know, your energy is one of the most important currencies, but that entire system is actually something that when you break those patterns, you begin to shift the things that you experience in your everyday life. Right. And so now you have to learn how to live. So humans are learning um, how to live in this in this realm in a way that is harmonious. We don't need to live in in survival, right. you know. And and this is, I mean, since the pandemic and since all those things that have happened, we're kind of shifting into another direction. A lot of people have kind of woken up consciousness during that time to question, whoa, what what was I doing this yeah. whole time? You they know, what was important? 
yeah, claustrophobic and, and um, questioning, you know, where was my attention? I was just slaving away at a job unconsciously. And now here I am at home with my family. We begin to wake up to the things that are happening around us. Right. Um, so I think that that was an important thing for humanity. And the next step now, now that we're going into bigger political issues in the world, we're going to be restructuring a lot of things. And the human has to prepare because the new human is the human that is sovereign, that is completely aware of how to manage this body. Number one, energetically, to be able to understand that they are the source of all of their core fundamental needs. And that is your love, your attention, your affection. Right. Um, and you know, the chains this, they put on themselves. Yes your safety, you know, because majority of us, we feel unsafe. And as you mentioned earlier, we're the perfect consumer, right? And that's what this system has designed. The entire, you know, Tavistock Institute marketing uh, programs are designed to manipulate you through your senses and through the ignorance of the self. So um, yeah, we're just saying that's, that's that. what art. That's what art has become. Art is now sure. a form of like that's what the graphic design. If mm-hmm. you want to become a an artist or a graphic designer, your job is to now work for advertisers. That's mm-hmm. what your art is for now is to is to better sell things, not to create an expression. You know, yeah, right. We fall exactly. into it. Exactly. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, uh, we are coming up on an hour now, which is, it flew by. It's fantastic. I think <laughs> yeah. it would be nice to take a couple questions. Yeah, and uh, now th- these have been flowing here. I don't want to rewind it too much, but uh, well, like Vishnal says, all rappers be putting chains on themselves. I don't know what that means, but fucking poetry, bro. Um, <laughs> does anybody have a question for our, our uh, guest today? Uh, before we depart for the evening. And uh, I suppose while some of those are, are loading there, um, I might as well ask you, uh, what, uh, what, is your, uh, what is your main source of, like, what would you like to promote here today, if I might ask you, which is just perfectly appropriate, I think. I got your website in the description. Oh, it's breaking up a little bit. Oh, sorry. more help integrating experiences trying to make sense of them understanding them um you know you can you can come work with me in hypnotherapy i also do something called dna reprogramming which is essentially deep um integrative shadow work emotional shadow work um and that's usually very powerful work you can find at my website geraldine roscoe i'm also going to be speaking at a lot of amazing conferences this year you can join me at the alaska cruise I'm going to be on a cruise all about ufology, all about contact, interdimensionality. Um, so Jealous. Amazing, yeah, it's a, I really hope you guys can join me. I would love to see you too. Um, but this is a, a cruise from Seattle up to Alaska. And, um, you know, you get to enjoy the beauty of the nature there and also do night watch tours up in the Alaska skies, which are going to be phenomenal. So definitely join me there if you can. Um, and you can find that information on my website. Well, um, uh, yeah. Static in Wonderland says, I definitely need some therapy right now. So I think oh, we'll be sending you awesome. in her direction. And she's um, hilarious, by the way. Uh, <laughs> there might be a tinge of sarcasm there, but just like most viewers of this channel and in the <laughs> community, it, it goes both. You know, there's there's a dark humor that takes place that Makes good. everything just a little bit better. Yeah, that's good. Um, somebody asked, can space-time fabric be bent like it is underwater? I don't understand the underwater part, but we're not the quite physicists in, in that regard, I think. So water. Hmm. Uh, that's a difficult yeah, I'm one. I'm not really sure what you mean, space-time bent underwater. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure. Other than the densities are different, so probably time space is going to be moving at a different rate. So, no, I don't know. 
I don't know what your question is. You got to stomp on that one, bro. Uh, okay. And now there's some, there's a couple comments here that are borderline inappropriate. Let's keep it. Come on, guys. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I can't read them, so I don't know. <laughs> oh, you can't read them on the, on your side? No. Probably for the best. Uh, <laughs> Well, all right, that actually might be a good spot to end it off because we had some great conversations there at the end. Okay, awesome. But I, I had a fantastic time talking to you, and I've My enjoyed goodness. watching your YouTube channel, by the way. And so, guys, uh, I know that she was talking about you know, her website and some of the services she provides. It's awesome, but she also has a YouTube channel that could use a little uh, love as well. And uh, I appreciate your time very much, Geraldine. Thank you so much. Much love to you. Thank you for having me on. It's been an honor. And nope. take care. I'll see you no soon. No problem. All right. Talk to you. Bye. Bye.